Okay, so my name is Igor Stokiszewski and I am uh, in the context of Culture for Solidarity, I have a double role. I am a representative of one of the project partners, Krytyka Polityczna, but also I have a role of and honor of uh, a co-curator together with Dorota Ogrodzka. Yes, hello. <laughs> The uh, research process we went through uh, um, the last year in order to try to understand the phenomenon whether culture can and if so, how can it contribute to the rise of solidarity, which we are lacking so much. And yeah, yeah, and we'll try to um, introduce it very shortly using two films, really interesting. One of them will be just introduction to longer film you can see tomorrow. So, so in order to speak about culture and solidarity, please let's see the first film. Especially <laughs> from Poland. Wolnością słowa nie jest mówienie czegoś o Żydach, o muzułmanach. Wolnością słowa w III Rzeszy nie była krytyka Żydów. Wolnością słowa w III Rzeszy była krytyka Hitlera, krytyka nacjonalizmu, krytyka nazizmu. To jest prawdziwa wolność słowa. Wolność tych, którzy głosu nie mają. Precz z czerwoną demokracją! Precz z czerwoną demokracją! Przyszliśmy tutaj po prostu modlić o odważnych ludzi. O odważnych ludzi, którzy przerwą ten spektakl. Klon, dwa, bon! Nasza dzisiejsza manifestacja ma charakter obronny. Polacy, katolicy, patrioci muszą stawać i dawać wyraźne świadectwo. Ludzie rozumni i przyzwoici są przeciwko klątwie. Kochani, zdaje się, że udało się posłowi Winnickiemu przedrzeć do środka i naszym młodym, odważnym... Następnym razem też będzie 
wyjdziemy. Zrobimy to po cicho. Uh, how did you like this uh, film? Who liked it a lot? <laughs> Who didn't like it at all? Okay, uh, we wanted to present you this film to uh, somehow show the context in which we believed that it is necessary to think about culture and solidarity. This is what uh, happened in 2017 in front of a public theater in uh, Warsaw, and it was not the only event happening there. It was an attempt to block a presentation of a performance entitled The Curse in a public repertoire theater in uh, Warsaw by the nationalists and, uh, well, let's say religious uh, groups. Uh, as I mentioned, it was not the only time when they tried to do it. Finally, they did manage to enter the theater a couple of times, and once even they spread uh, gas and injured two uh, people. And what I see in this uh, film is a kind of mirror of, of uh, what is happening both in Poland and widely speaking in Europe. So I see uh, polarization, I see violence, I see very, very bad and strong emotions. But I see one more thing which might be a little bit controversial in the context of this place. Uh, I also wonder what happened to culture and arts that it can evoke or is able to evoke uh, this kind of social fire, because on the one hand we can judge uh, the people there, the nationalists and so on, we can say they are not educated, they do not understand art, they should go back to school or go to uh, theater for special lessons of, uh, um, you know, of understanding the contemporary uh, art. Uh, but maybe uh, there is also something within the artistic and cultural practices, which is not exactly contributing to the rise of solidarity among the people. What I'm trying to say is that definitely, from our perspective, the perspective who were of people who were there in front of the theater, not on the nation nationalistic side, it is absolutely fundamental to defend those institutions and the critical approach to art. We should absolutely defend it. But I remember a quotation from, no, no, uh, anyway, no more philosophers, especially the French ones, but um, that, of course, it is extremely relevant to produce critical art, but it is also relevant today to uh, produce culture, to make culture which, is, uh, which can provide new light, the new light for the future. And that was why we decided to, uh, to do uh, culture for solidarity, action research and cultural activities about which that I will say a few words now. Uh, yes, because um, this project grew uh, out of uh, this, let's say, sad diagnosis of um, of our uh, our culture and our public sphere, but also uh, grew out of uh, thought that uh, culture is meaningful and it could uh, work not only. Um, for disintegration and alienation, polarization of society, but uh, it could work uh, for um, integration and uh, it could create uh, an occasion to uh, dialogue, to uh, empathy, to understanding and uh, to integrate diversity somehow. And uh, it was the starting point for this uh, project um the main uh, the main part was uh, uh the research but also a process of designing and inventing uh projects and artistic interventions um uh, which take place in uh, uh five countries uh Pol it was Poland uh, Spain Croatia uh Moldova and France, of course, last but not least. And um, um, during this debate, um, 
you uh, you will um, uh, you will have chance to uh, hear about some of uh, those projects. But now, just to give a short example, we'll show a um, trailer of film. Uh, this film you could uh, see here tomorrow, uh, six o'clock, at the evening. It is uh, a symphony of uh, Factory Ursus. Ursus was uh, is, in fact, one of the plays uh, of our uh, projects and intervention uh, in culture for solidarity um, uh, pro project. And um, this film uh, is an example of um, how we can. Uh, act with culture uh, in long-term process of working uh, with community. Uh, it is film of Jasmina Wojcik and Igor uh, Stokwiszewski. And um, we just want to show you a short trailer because uh, we believe that uh, what is to invent it now uh, is uh, a new paradigm of culture which is based uh, on another values like cooperation, understanding, and solidarity itself, finally. So uh, it is just to uh, make you cur curious for tomorrow. Um, because, uh, yeah, this film is an example how we can act with art. In this case, this art is uh, documentary film. So maybe just I if you can. Before we, Do you want to uh, add? yes, I just wanted to uh, add to what we are going to see. I really invite everybody who has not feel, seen the film for uh, tomorrow. But very often, uh, the first film uh, presented something which is related to theater, professional artistic activity, and very often in our uh, activities uh, with communities, with our uh, uh, bottom-up cultural approaches, we hear that it's very interesting. It's cultural animation nice 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 but it's not really it has nothing to do with art with the real art no so it was quite an effort uh, for us to try to translate the deep cultural practices with community into this very bad medium of film because uh, film medium is the worst medium in the world it's uh, commercial, it's undemocratic, it's extremely uh, demanding in regards to work time, uh, plus it's extremely expensive. Uh, and um, I think we have a feeling at least that um, this film is also an example that it's not about cultural animation, it's not about working with communities, that art in a large scale can also benefit from such uh, um, uh, practices and can be equal to everything which is perceived as serious artistic practices by the general public. So let's see the tailor and uh, then <laughs> thank you so much. Oh. <laughs> Ten ogrom to przeraża. To było norma 7,5 tony do przerzutu. Robiliśmy po 16, po 14. Chmura jakby się oberwała. Tak ludzie do pracy szli. Tu 21 tysięcy ludzi pracowało. W tym zakładzie. Jak staliśmy i patrzyliśmy, jak to szło pod młot, jak to niszczyły wszystko zakład, który dawał chleb.
Antes de continuar, nos gustaría darle muchísimas gracias a Elena, que está haciendo la traducción simultánea. Así que muchas gracias. Y a María también, que estará estos días con, con nosotras. Bueno, eh, ahora llega el momento de la, de la mesa redonda y le voy a pedir, por favor, a Marta Vallejo, Jane Wells, Igor de nuevo, Iva Kukic y Lara García que, por favor, se unan al escenario. Un aplauso, por favor. La, para los que habéis llegado, for, so for those who just arrived, uh, there is uh, headphones for the translation, but for later, sorry, for later, yes, true. So we have, a, we have an audio source code uh, later after the panel. So if you take now the headphones, is uh, better than than later. Okay, thank you. Okay, maybe, okay. So, thank you very much for being here. And um, it feels like a dream to me to come to Sevilla to finally have this kind of microphone. I feel like an artist that I'm speaking in English. So, it's like, you know, like the total uh, unexpected uh, situation for me. Um, the panel, like the conversation we will be having today, Is, uh, is around the topic of uh, imagining new ways of living together, which is uh, a rather appropriate uh, topic given the images that we just uh, watched that are like uh, terrifying, but also given the news with which uh, we all went to sleep last night. So after a long day of, uh, of meeting, organizing, discussing, uh, I went to sleep and I just checked uh, the news briefly and I watched that uh, in Algeria the last dictator of this, uh, of this uh, uh, northern side of, uh, of Africa who would, nobody would have ever expected to, uh, to step down, uh, who was uh, expected to die in uh, ruling a country with, uh, with an iron fist, he finally stepped down, not because of his kindness but because of... Uh, the new ways of living together that have been put into practice throughout all the years of uh, dictatorship and during the last uh, weeks in which uh, every Friday people kept on gathering uh, energy and reasons and, and hope and stubbornness to, uh, to go down in the streets and, and imagining another way of, uh, of being Algerian and of being a citizen. So we have, uh, when we try to To, to think about uh, how can we live together differently in Europe. It's very inspiring to, uh, to check out how is, it go, how is it being held in, uh, in, our neighboring, uh, in our neighboring regions because there is a lot of impossible that can be achieved and it always seems impossible to sustain and to hold these, uh, these impossibilities. It's exhausting. Uh, just before we start, Uh, when I was watching this, um, this video, it came to my mind this quote by, uh, by an old activist, uh, French activist, uh, Daniel Ben Said, like uh, when, when we were uh, organizing and creating uh, ways of resisting with, uh, with fellow friends in, in Egypt during the, these uh, previous years of dictatorship, this quote always came back to our minds, like after having experienced the power and the, you know, the stroke of a revolution, uh, how do you handle the, this in-betweenness? And this quote uh, said something like, uh, reminding that as we are more used to, uh, to domes of, uh, of failure, of defeat, than uh, to uh, mornings of, of triumphant uh, mornings of success, we have earned the very precious right to constantly restart. So uh, I think that uh, in a way this, uh, this panel, this conversation that, uh, that will play with, uh, with fate. So <laughs> this, we, will, uh, we will propose you um, 
this, uh, this kind of magical uh, reenactment, uh, we have prepared a set of, uh, of questions, like there are 30 possible questions around here, and they are hidden within uh, fortune cookies. So uh, we will see what fortune will bring out in the conversation. And uh, so before we start, I will briefly introduce you our four guests of honor. <laughs> On the on one side, just like it's been a speed dating, so I have to check the notes. <laughs> we have uh, we have Lara Garcia Diaz uh, on my on my right side. She comes from uh, she's living in Barcelona and she's a researcher in uh, Antwerp Institute for Art and something else that I forgot <laughs> for the arts Institute for the Arts and uh, she's. Um, her research focuses on, uh, on cultural practices that, uh, that have as, at its core uh, the, the care, the notion of caring and uh, of uh, reproduction, so uh, economic reproduction. So uh, with a very strong uh, feminist approach, she's part of uh, LARRE, a collective of, uh, of uh, that, that research on feminist pract practices and methodologies in the, in the cultural field. You may correct me later on if I have missed something. Uh, here we have Igor Stokfiszewski, and I am super proud to <laughs> properly pronounce it. Uh, he's a journalist, an activist, an artist, and uh, and he's part of Kritika uh, Politnitska. And uh, so, Politnitska, Kritika. Hey, that close. Uh, he's been uh, he's been uh, involved in the research that uh, they have been sharing with us this morning and uh, briefly. So uh, he has been also very involved in the movements for the commons and the different uh, research and movements uh, around Europe that uh, that are reconsidering the uh, the commons approach as a as an alternative uh, way of handling our societies. We have Jane Wells here on my left. She's uh, from Northern Ireland, and uh, she's an artist, activist, curator, right? And uh, she's been a member, a founding member of the uh, London Irish Anti uh, Abortion Coalition. Abortion rights. Ay, casi, again. And uh, she's, um, she's also a, a program manager for the Tate Change uh, program, uh, a program that is uh, devoted to reconsider the role of uh, museums and in, in its relation with uh, society. So you will probably be able to, uh, to develop it further. And uh, Eva Chukic. Kuchic. Yes. <laughs> it's my arachnid instinct with the pronunciation. She comes from Belgrade. She's, a, she's an architect and has a PhD on uh, urban development. And uh, she's one of the funding members of uh, Ministry of Space, which is a, a collective that gathers uh, activists, uh, architects, urban planners, political uh, deputies, uh, and citizens to, uh, to discuss and to reflect about uh, the challenges of urban planning in uh, cities like Belgrade nowadays, right? Muy bien. So you will complete. <laughs> you will fill in the gaps. So without further delay, we will start the performance. Fortune is unveiled. So um, I will, like, you will allow me to be the first one to open the cake. I feel very proud. So um, here's what Fortune may tell. Una, dos, tres. Madre mía, it's very well folded. So. If you don't mind, we will start in this direction. Uh, the game is, uh, I will read the question out loud. Uh, I will address it to each one of uh, them. Uh, in case uh, one of them doesn't feel fully comfortable with the question or would rather pass on, we will, uh, we will keep it uh, running. So, question number 23 says, querida Lara, is it realistic to work on culture and have a sustainable life? Ahí lo llevas. <laughs> You may eat it and <laughs> of it because. Um, <laughs> I I would say yes. Um, it is really difficult. I mean, you have to do a lot of malabars. Um, I guess like um, 
you really need to operate in very different fields and with very different people. So it's not like this idea that sustainability is going to be based on a long-term job or, you know, like just one one income, etc. I think, um, yeah, you will have to do Malabars again. Um, and... Yeah, I guess it's also like the question for me would be what 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 does it mean to have a sustainable life also? I guess like, um, and what does it mean to work on culture? And what I mean with that is that um, sometimes you can also have a sustainable life not just um, being depending on economic income. So you also can create other sorts of, um, I don't know, effective networks or other kind of... Um, networks, but I would say yes, but it's really difficult. Yeah. <laughs> would you open, oh, would you uh, would you feel like answering as I well, know, or? I thought that you yeah, I'm sorry. the pair of us could, no? No, I think we have plenty of cookies. We could open a new one, no? Okay. What do you feel like? I don't think <laughs> yeah, anyone wants to. Um, I, oh, I, you know what, I have a microphone. <laughs> I have a microphone right here. I, don't, I think it's a really, I think it's really important for us to talk about this because I've been in both positions inside and outside of the institution mm -hmm. um, and have reached burnout in both of those places. And it's something that we spoke about earlier in our session. It's real and I think people skirt around it a lot. Um, you know, I was working as an activist for years lived in a tent um, and, you know, was really stinky. And it was an amazing experience, but um, I wasn't well as a person and I couldn't keep living like that forever. And now I work in this huge institution where I am constantly presented with these incredible opportunities that often end up being quite exploitative because I don't know how to say no to stuff. And maybe that's on me, but I think a lot of the time you know, and I acknowledge my privilege of working with inside the institution and the protected spaces that I have around me. But, um, you know, the, the, my coworkers um, are currently negotiating um, a pay deal. Um, with Tate Modern was the um, most visited tourist attraction in, in London this year, over six million visitors. Um, it is a highly profitable organization and yet staff are underpaid. Most staff working under the living wage in London. Um, and it's really amazing actually to see my coworkers now rise and I stand with them against um, unfair, unfair payment. I think living in big cities is becoming increasingly difficult to work in, in and engage with culture in a sustainable way. Good, you opened your fortune cookie. <laughs> okay, question number 28. Oh my God, this is the... Uh, could you name a cultural activity you attended and you felt it was politically transformative? Yes, I could. <laughs> <laughs> would you? <laughs> uh, no, but seriously speaking, it's a, it's a, it's a, for me it's a beautiful question because uh, this is precisely what uh, me but also an environment of people I collaborate with since many, many years. This is precisely what we are trying to understand, how to, uh, how to, um, or one, one part of our activities is dedicated to the question, how to politically transform reality with the tools of artistic interventions. And, um, uh, you know, not to tell the whole biography of myself and all my friends, let me just mention that uh, uh, the trailer of the film you saw um, uh, a few minutes ago and the film that we are going to see tomorrow, please uh, feel um, uh, invited to join us at uh, 6 p.m. here. Uh, they, there are a few dynamics within this work. It's a community work, uh, a community artistic work made by Yashmina Vujic since 2011. So it's already eight years of uh, work with one specific community. So you really, one has really 
to go through the whole process with the community, the good moments and the bad moments. It's not a kind of approach where we, uh, where we work with many communities and we are in, uh, let's say, short uh, period contact with them. We are together with those people since years and um, it's quite demanding. And of course, one part of, um, of this work is dedicated to the question how to empower them and how to create community bonds, even with a kind of traditionally, ritualist, almost ritualistic tools. We are also from a tradition of, uh, you know, in Poland, this approach is quite well developed. But there is another part of this work, which maybe will not be so visible in the film which is uh, a political question. How people like that, so ex-workers from the closed factory, and there are approximately 20,000 inhabitants of that origin in the Ursus district in Warsaw, how can, with their capacities as elderly people, as people from the lower class, from the working class, and so on, how can they be politically effective in terms of uh, vocalizing and achieving their political claims in regards to what should happen with this district after this factory is gone. And um, in fact, um, and I think it is one of the most, uh, in case of cultural artistic experiments, uh, referring to political potentialities of community arts, democratic arts, and so on. This is the experience I, I really um, I can um, uh, point on. Uh, I will not say a story about our political struggles with the elderly people in Ursus because it's a long story. But uh, let me tell you that uh, we have uh, some achievements. Thank you. <laughs> Here's the teaser. <laughs> More to follow. <laughs> yes, of course. Ah, OK, so it works. Um, yeah, so now uh, Igor really gave me a nice um, schlagwort, we say, uh, uh, to, to link on. Uh, so I'm coming from the collective that was very active in uh, cultural sphere, but also um, like using culture to address different topics that are leading to some kind of social or political uh, change. Um, we actually had one activity that was related to uh, kind of pointing out the illegal privatization of the cinemas and uh, privatization where uh, workers, actually shareholders in the uh, ex-Yugoslav self-management system stayed without anything. And uh, through collaboration with them, we actually liberated or occupied a uh, cinema in Belgrade 2014 which was a very important point in a sense of political transformation. So what it brought, so it, it, we work on that for years, so three years constantly working and addressing the topic of privatization, of the workers' right, of what, how public property is managed. Uh, from that occupation, there are several movements that emerge, which are super important for nowadays. So anti-eviction movement, student movement, then uh, leftist uh, uh, movements and uh, one uh, municipalist platform that uh, emerged as a, a new platform that went for the, for the local elections. And those all groups happen in that one particular space. And when you think about the action, it was kind of like, like let's occupy the cinema and address the topic that we don't have where to watch movies. But behind that, there is a huge thing that, that's going on and that we are aware of, but you are not addressing it in that manner. But after a few months, people figure out. Uh, they, they, are, they were uh, completely aware of what they uh, attended and why the, what the, they supported. And there is actually a movie called uh, Occupation of Cinema Zvezda that was released a few months ago that is following the whole process. It's a documentary movie and I recommended you to, to watch it because besides all the things that like describing the whole process, it, uh, she, Senka, uh, the director, succeeded to um, track all the failures and like complications and traumas of collective decision making <laughs> and collective responsibility. So you can also learn from that movie. <laughs> it's your turn, Jane. It's your turn for faith. Ah, you wanted to... Uh... <laughs> okay, the question is, um, 
Oh, is it gone off? Ah, no, good, good crack. You mainly go. Ah, you switched it off. How to defend the role of culture in an economical cycle of austerity? Um, I don't. Oh gosh. Okay. <laughs> Let me just clean myself up here. You first. might just I'll buy some eat time. the fortune cookie first. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. This is something that I come up against a lot working in a big museum um, that is partially funded by public money of kind of constantly having to justify the work that we do um, and think about the KPIs. And uh, K KPIs are, K are key performance indicators that I have to submit to um, the, the Arts Council and the government every year that I'm hitting these targets. And my practice in particular is, see is seen as a really big risk, I suppose, of failure. Um, and that's something like typically that funding bodies are not very interested in, particularly at a time of, of austerity. Um, and, and, and actually, Igor, when you were speaking earlier about capturing social practice and you really kind of like the performing, the, the change and the transformation that we're seeing, it's really hard to capture that and justify it in a way that, that isn't um, storytelling. Um, for us, I think we've had to like really rethink what, what our aims are as a public space and as a, as a public institution um, and really kind of like taking a lot of the public on that journey with us. Um, we've seen, and again, like in relation to the last question, like really profound change in a lot of the people who visit our space. Um, so the, the space that I run at Tate Modern, it, it's not a gallery. So we have floors and floors of galleries of places where one artist is, um, you know, their work is on a wall or it's a sculpture and their voice is privileged um, above everybody else's and their, you know, that their, their, their value is placed on their position in the way that they live on the world. And, and, our, and our floor, the, the program that I run, it's really about that kind of multiplicity of voices and finding space for, for, for the collision of ideas and ways of living in the world and constantly finding ways to, to enable that and to enable speaking in some way. Um, and in the beginning, we, didn't, we really didn't have a lot of funding at all. Um, there was a really small pot of money that Tate put in to, um, to this really big risk. And, and the way that we... I guess in relation to the question that we've defended that is is bringing unlikely people together and actually really spending time with people and asking people to give us that chance and to take a risk with us. Risk is the, is the value on which we work, on which we practice. Um, and really seeing people's lives change because of it. Um, a sense of inclusion and tackling things like loneliness, rethinking the problems in our society that we really want to tackle and that the government is failing us at. Um, yeah, I think I've gone on a ramble. <laughs> I hope that answers. Does anyone have uh, anything to add? Who would like to take the risk? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm coming from a country where 0.5% of total budget goes to culture, 0.5%. And 80% of that nothingness goes to maintaining the buildings. So basically, uh, it's a mission impossible. Uh, we had uh, uh, one summer we tested uh, like uh, culture in protest. Uh, it was the event that uh, lasted a few months and like nobody wanted to do anything. So we had a small step forward, but not, uh, not a big one. And we were thinking maybe for this year to make a new campaign like give us at least 1%. <laughs> Sounds super sad, but you have to start um, from somewhere. But no, but our prime minister came with the uh, great idea to make a council for creative industries and like creative, um, creative industry, it was like that, mm -hmm. something like that, um, where nobody knows what they're actually doing, uh, what is their role, who is involved there, what it will bring, you know, so you have like um, uh, the theaters, the majority of them have no budget, the museums were closed, now some of them are open, the galleries are basically have no funding, and then you have the independent cultural scene that is completely on the margins, like literally and uh, metaphorically. <laughs>
<laughs> Don't leave the microphone because you will open a cookie after her I, answer. I just, because I, I was thinking about, um, no, like this question. Actually, I think um, how to defend the role of culture in an economical cycle of austerity, I would say creating counter narratives. And what I mean with that is that, I mean, uh, how the role of culture is being defined in times of austerity nowadays, it's precisely, yeah, like, um, like cultural industries, tourism, I don't know, Malaga, the city of the museums, or I don't know, no, like creative city, all these kind of things. I mean, um, so I think we really need counter narratives to really um, think about, yeah, like what is the role of culture and then use these counter narratives to really fight against cycles of austerity. Because I think, yeah, we just need to reposition that debate within maybe in other parameters. That's what came to my mind, but I don't have the, the answer. Yeah, and if I may, it just reminded me of uh, like, a, a, like a nowadays example in Barcelona. There is currently a, a platform of neighbors that has been organized in my neighborhood in Raval uh, because they reclaim a better uh, space for their uh, health, uh, health center, like public health uh, center. Uh, the one space that they have is a heritage building, so it cannot be renewed, and the building has increased its population uh, like widely uh, in the last 25 years. So um, the one space that uh, the authorities have considered to be a, like a, a proper and suitable solution for the relocation of this uh, health center actually uh, had been uh, leased by the municipality to the Magba, which is like a contemporary art museum. So um, nowadays, what could have been a, a, a media conflict about uh, health versus culture has developed in a, a space, an occupation of the space by this uh, neighborhood uh, platform in which uh, art practitioners, um, local, uh, local activists uh, and, uh, and passersby gather in order to practice not only, uh, not, not to prepare only a, a counter narrative, but also a counter practice of uh, what culture is and how culture is contaminated by, uh, by austerity uh, in, in, in your own body, no? in your own physical uh, experience. So yeah, there you go, go for a cookie. At some point, we will have to eat all these crackers, and maybe you might not uh, perceive it, but from here, it actually smells sweet. So at some point, we will start eating it, and <laughs> please feel free. <laughs> Does anyone from an island near <laughs> has any opinion on the matter? What does everyone? <laughs> I actually, you know what? Okay, I'm gonna like give this one a go, <laughs> and I'm really gonna try and not be too angry because that's the state that I've been in for a quite a long time. So I like I'm from Northern Ireland, right? Northern Ireland is suddenly in the news again. After 20 years of it kind of disappearing from the, the mainstream media because we've been in this relative period of peace and all of a sudden everybody's an expert on Northern Ireland again and everybody's talking about the border. Um, and the, like, the, the, the reality is that I'm angry because the people of Northern Ireland knew the value of the EU. We had felt it in a, really, in a real way for a very long time, um, you know, the peace process is bound by the, both the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom being EU member states. Um, the peace process was funded by the EU. The people of Northern Ireland voted to remain in the EU. And, you know, even, even the word Brexit, Britain, exit, Northern Ireland is not part of Britain, but it's being dragged out of the EU along with Britain. And, you know, it feels like this huge colonial act of power for a lot of people in Northern Ireland. And there's been a real rise in nationalism in the north of Ireland. And, and Irish nationalism is a belief in a united Ireland. Um, and it's interesting because now a lot of my friends people that I know are out in the streets protesting for another referendum. 
Um, and I haven't been with them, to be honest, because, I mean, I love that, or what? Because there's a part of me that thinks, actually, it's maybe not about Brexit and it's maybe about the United Kingdom and what that really means. And like, there's a part of me that feels that I want to go home actually and, and start a vote leave campaign for leaving the United Kingdom. Um, and I, and Scotland, I'm, I have friends who live there who feel very similarly. Um, I don't even know what's gonna happen, who knows? You know, I saw this great tweet the other day and it was like 13, or no, it was like the year 3023 and the Houses of Parliament were starting up for the day and they were having their daily vote down the Theresa May Brexit deal because it was just become this tradition that everybody was just <laughs> doing for like a millennium. Um, yeah, who knows what's going to happen, but that for me that feels like f speaking from my heart that feels like what might happen. So what? <laughs> <laughs> I said it. <laughs> Seventeen. What is wrong with Europe? Uh, <laughs> I understood what is wrong with you. <laughs> I, I, that would be easier to answer, actually. I would be glad to answer that one. <laughs> Throw it on the floor. I Go. Uh, well, there are a few things uh, which are not too well with Europe. No, I wanted to uh, uh, share something because, of course, uh, an, um, an issue of... Uh, Europe and what is wrong and what went wrong, uh, uh, which led to a point where we are at the moment. It's a big topic and there are so many uh, things we could speak about. So I was thinking about, um, uh, when I hear about Europe nowadays, my question is, what does motivate, what um, fires the most emotional reaction in me? What I really worry about in, uh, in the next uh, months and uh, years. And I am thinking about the European elections. And I am thinking about the phenomenon which is happening among this uh, community of people one might call um, nationalistic international. Uh, you know, people like the Polish government uh, um, uh, uh, with the leadership of uh, Jarosław Kaczyński, the Hungarian government with the leadership of Viktor Orban, our friends, not friends from Italy, uh, but um, also, uh, you know, many others, nationalistic movements. Until now, there was a, a kind of assumption that their idea is to disintegrate Europe completely and just come back to national states or other forms of, uh, of neighborhooding with each other. But I am very afraid that in the meantime, the strategy completely changed. Uh, what we observe in Poland now and what is visible in Hungary and in other countries in which nationalistic dynamics is getting higher and higher is that they have a new project which is really a project of, uh, of uh, nationalistic international which would like to overtake the European institutions and overtake the European public space and transform it according to their values which are, <clears throat> as far as I can recognize, could be listed as uh, four horses of the apocalypse of Europe, uh, which is, of course, uh, uh, colonialism, capitalism, uh, fascism, and um, at whatever you want. <laughs> so days, days in European, so-called European identity, whatever it is, there is a part of a dark identity of Europe we know very well. We are in a country which was an empire for so many years and was really behaving in a very bad way, Felipe, you know? So we know very well that within the European identity, European dynamics, European history, there is this dark part which uh, I believe, unfortunately, now can be energized by the, uh, by the nationalists and they will not want Europe to disintegrate anymore. 
they will want Europe to be together, but to be, you know, strong, fascistic, capitalistic, colonialistic, and so on. This is uh, my biggest worry. Uh, so, and this, uh, at the moment, I think is really wrong with uh, Europe. Not so wrong, Yala. Another one, and you can pass it on to Lara, maybe, that she couldn't reply this one. <laughs> it's an e-change, a fair e-change. This is Europe. <laughs> Crumbling down. <laughs> Twenty-seven. I think, what is your? Uh. You mean what is what is your last entry yes. yeah. about on social uh, uh, media? Uh, Kittens. <laughs> look, I have no Facebook. I have no Twitter account. I don't use social media. So <laughs> my last entry was about nothing. <laughs> <laughs> mm, to be honest, my last entry about. So my last entry in social media was Themos98 and hashtag culture for solidarity <laughs> <laughs> um, to see what you guys were posting and just like checking some information if someone was posting anything else. Um, so yeah, that's my answer. And yours? Getting. I am. Um, I you know what I I really pulled back from social media um, a couple of years ago because it just had become such a kind of polemical, angry space for me. And I think it's important to have that, but it was like coming out of me in a way that I just um, was not helpful. Um, but I sometimes post like happy stuff. I was doing this program couple of weeks ago with um, young people with autism and we all made profiles of ourselves and um, I made mine and it was my three things that I like the most. <laughs> this is so lame, but it was biscuits, <laughs> sunshine and mountains. Wow. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, do, I, I, like, I, I think that's a kind of like an important, I don't know, it's been a really important like tool of self-care for me to like disengage from those conversations on Twitter wars and... <laughs> Uh, my last entry was related to the visit that we had from MIT um, in America. They, they visited us, like 12 students and a few teachers, and they wanted to learn more about uh, different practices, alternative struggles, and so on that exist in Belgrade. So we took them uh, to meet, uh, first we had a few presentations, and then we took them to self-managed workers' museum which is uh, in the squatted old building that some yeah, a few years ago belonged to the workers of uh, Trudbenik factory who actually made that museum. Then to different occupy spaces and self-managed spaces and also met them with the uh, anti-eviction movement and so on. And what was my strongest uh, actually impression was that those people, for example, first for the first time that education and health system can be free. And we were talking about self-management and the socialist heritage in Yugoslavia, and we told them that we are surprised that we are have to paying, we will have to pay for health system and education. They were like, but it was for free, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you meet people from another universe, you know? That was kind of my impression. I was really, like, um, it was really hard for me to understand that. Um, so, yeah, uh, my, my last entry was about whole impression for those three days encounter. Um... Cookies are super tasty, and I think that they are kind of calling you. So I think it would be your turn to uh, to open one of these questions or to uh, propose a direct question that might have uh, come to your spirit during the talk. So it's the audience time. Would you like to come forward and pick one, or um, or maybe I will open one and there's a. I cannot see you guys. <laughs> okay, so while you think about it, I will do it again. <laughs> so, question number 13, take your time. 
think about it. If you could invent a new European political party, which will be the name of it, and share your main cultural policy? Wow. Who wants to answer? <laughs> I will not punish anyone with this as a direct question. Anyone feels empowered? <laughs> I mean, it's a... Okay, I have a problem with, uh, with this uh, fiction element. Um, <laughs> because... No, no, because... Uh, um, all my dreams about new political parties never came to reality and maybe it's just the way reality works, no? But I think, uh, I want to share one, uh, one thought uh, with you in regards to cultural policies. Uh, I don't know how in, uh, well, okay, uh, I want to say that I have a feeling as if we were one step before formulating really courageous new ideas for cultural uh, uh, policies on the local, national and uh, European uh, levels. I am very glad I am looking at, uh, at the audience, uh, most of you, I more or less uh, know I am looking at uh, Federico Alagna, who was the deputy mayor of, of the city of Messina, uh, responsible for culture, for uh, education. And what, what I am trying to say is that among us already, there are so many very advanced practitioners of new approaches in uh, culture that it is just a matter of time when we find a way how to get together and propose a very, you know, courageous and uh, progressive um, uh, cultural uh, policy. And we should do it, because also um, I see uh, there, is a, there is a huge gap. You mentioned about, uh, about uh, cultural industries in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Serbia. Precisely, the, uh, I, in, in Poland, in many countries, I think, people uh, in power, they do understand that the culture that they uh, did until now doesn't work anymore and it's not uh, attracting, uh, attracting the audiences. They look at their indicators and they see, oh my God, people are not, <laughs> you know, the audience of this and, uh, and um, uh, that. And um, uh, so there is already a gap. And I am in Poland many times addressed with a question whether, you know, I, my friends, my circles could, could help or inspire a little bit the cultural policies. So, let's get together, you know, let's construct a cultural policy. We don't have to organize a political party, but uh, let's have a good cultural policy and advocate for it. Other insights around here? <laughs> and any question from here? Don't you really want to feel the situation? <laughs> so kind. Okay, for the translation. It's sweet. Question number 22. So, what would you chat about with the passenger? You know, this person has a different ideolo ideology than yours, right beside you in a 12 hours plane. Ooh. <laughs> Very good question. I, I, I should, no, I don't want to answer it. <laughs> I, I'm not in the debate. I only wanted to, uh, to, <laughs> to, to I, I only wanted to to open the cookie. For me, in such a long uh, journey, I wouldn't speak. I would fall asleep for sure. So, it's, but it's not not as a as an ideological statement, as a as a method for. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I will sleep like around. Six hours, so yeah, six hours. I will speak about values, and I will start from there. I will start to see 
um, what are to see if really our values are different and to see where that started. And after I will speak about, um, I don't think that you can go to values directly in a conversation in a plane with a person that you don't know. Um, so I will start with general questions or I think we will have a general conversation and from there more about childhood parents. <laughs> Weather. <laughs> Weather. <laughs> Things I, like. I love, I, oh, it's gone off again. This was the echo, so. Yeah. Oh, I love this question. I it's just to say, I feel really passionately about canvassing, like on people's doorsteps. Um, I, I, I ran the canvassing for the, repeal, the campaign um, to repeal the Eighth Amendment from the Irish Constitution and the conversations that were had on the doorsteps, I think was like one of the biggest markers of change that happened, like the, the shift in the narrative that happened from the beginning of that campaign when, you know, people wouldn't talk about abortion um, and to, to people like, you know, like greeting me on the street with open arms. And, you know, the most important, I, the reason that I feel so passionate about canvassing is because my father, was really fervently anti-abortion for, for years and wouldn't speak to me about it and was so deeply ashamed that I was doing any of this work. Um, and, you know, the most important canvas for me really was at home with him. And we, you know, the, so the 12-hour plane ride, like for me, that happened in long car journeys with him. Um, where we would sit in really awkward silence together for the beginning um, and just like gradually, I think, softening him to the idea of who I was and understanding the reasons why he was so opposed to it. It like it turned out a lot of it was that he thought that maybe I had a secret story that he didn't know about and that terrified him. And so understanding where he was coming from really allowed me to open up a conversation with him. And like we spoke today in one of our groups about... Um, the, you know, what you need to do this type of work and time is one of the most precious things to be, so to be stuck with someone for 12 hours, not necessarily, I, you know, I don't know sometimes if like it, you, if it's always helpful to go in from a point of wanting to change someone's mind, but being open to, to that conversation, I think is really important. You know, there were like conversations that I had with people on their doorsteps. Um, there was one man who chased me down his, road with a pitchfork to calling me a murderer and I ran away from that guy <laughs> but then there were other people who you know had like a softer approach to the to the topics that we were talking about who maybe didn't know so much and finding out where those gaps are um, and that's a really easy place to come in from and not being afraid of it wow we leave it here should like I will open one last cookie and everyone will have a topic to discuss in the pause, in the break, in between uh, our roundtable and the audiovisual source code that will come afterwards. So think about it. Ooh, okay, this is a super good uh, icebreaker for the cigarette pause. Question 26. There you go. And with this lovely thought that uh, Fortune has brought to us, <laughs> I think uh, we could uh, call it an end. And, and just like, don't leave, because there will be a super cool presentation later on. So it's been a pleasure, guys. And so I think that what is sexy about Europe is like us, starting from here. And then, you know, like the sharing is getting, the ta ti ta ta but uh, being sexy makes Europe, Europe sexy. <laughs> Okay.